Welcome to a special edition of Under the Ring Pro Wrestling Conversations. My name is Phil Strum. Uh, more big news in the world of wrestling, which broke on Friday night. So we've got a, a panel together today to discuss it. We've got Juan Johnson, once again, who's been on the show before, as has Nick Towalk, both from Wrestling Junkie. Check him out online. Uh, so pretty much the biggest thing that could possibly uh, happen in terms of personnel in WWE has happened. Vince McMahon resigned on Friday as executive chairman of TKO and WWE uh, amid an avalanche of sexual sex trafficking and rape allegations from a former employee, Janelle Grant, who came forward. The lawsuit came out on Thursday in a rather long story in the Wall Street Journal, uh, which led to Friday's news, which essentially happened because Slim Jim pulled out the largest uh, sponsorship partnership in WWE, pulled out of that partnership. And then what followed was what we got from Vince McMahon on Friday. He says that he will vigorously fight the allegations against him. Uh, TKO indicates that there is an investigation ongoing. So we're going to try to break down all the different parts of this on this show now, uh, including WWE's reaction to it, Paul Levesque's reaction to it on Saturday after the Royal Rumble and all the, the pieces in between. So I'll start with you, Vaughn. Uh, when the news started coming out and when the and just kept coming, what was your uh, what were your thoughts? Man, uh, the lawsuit, number one, was just disturbing in a lot of ways uh through 67 pages and i feel like i've heard this from multiple people the more you read on the worse it got as Absolutely. far as the allegations uh regarding uh vince mcmahon but yeah it just felt like you know and, and obviously this is before the news of him you know resigning from his position it just felt like there's no way they can keep vince around after this graphic lawsuit dropped and it's, again it's just a lawsuit it's, these are just allegations but I feel like people have been ousted from their high ranking positions for less than what we read in in the lawsuit. So it was shocking. It was disturbing. And honestly, in some ways, disgusting. But again, these are just allegations. And again, not surprised that Vince resigned from his position. It just felt like the more you read on, it just felt like what other choice did T T TKO have but to you know, just kind of reevaluate the relationship there between the company and Vince. And I'm sure I know Vince resigned. That's this this is the official position here, but I'm I'm willing to bet that he he was talked into resigning by someone within TKO. Uh, but it felt like there's no other way out of this besides Vince McMahon completely removing himself from this situation. As this situation gets settled, and depending on how the situation plays out, there could be more situations that arise in the future. And. What's interesting for me, and I agree with you, I, I think someone probably did ask him to uh, to leave, especially considering what was happening financially to the company at that point, too, having lost their biggest sponsorship. Um, Nick, to me, the, what was in the suit, and I read pretty much the entire thing without even reading the story, believe it or not, because uh, I don't have a Wall Street Journal subscription, so I didn't read it. I read your version of it, I, of what was going on in the news, and I read the direct link to the uh, the text itself. Um, the lawsuit showed a culture of power, of fear, of control, and a fear of retribution from the company. So what does TKO need to do to address that? Because, you know, the other piece of it for me is I don't know, and someone maybe in WWE knows this or who works there knows this, but I don't know how the rules differ for a talent who's an independent contractor versus an employee who would actually have access to human resources. So what do you think that, what, do, what needs to happen with the culture here? Well, that, that's, I mean, that's the, the biggest question, I think. Um, one of the things that bothered a lot of observers in the aftermath of Vince resigning was the feeling in some, you know, areas of, of, of the wrestling business that, oh, well, maybe the problem is solved because Vince is gone. And I, and I think that, you know, it, it, we can't possibly stop there. Um, and, and it was a little disturbing, I think, too, that Slim Jim came back so quickly, right? Because their financial pressure, obviously, 
uh, played a part in Vince's resignation, but they came back awfully quickly too. Uh, and I think, and I think that that's, that's not, that's not a great sign. Um, I don't think that anybody should, should feel comfortable. Like, well, Vince is the only problem. As you said, there's clearly a cultural problem there. And I think it starts with, um, you know, thoroughly investigating, right? Because Vince was was under internal investigation by the board uh, prior to this most recent lawsuit coming out. And he was able to, in my mind, get away from a lot of the repercussions of that by changing the board uh, to, to, you know, have a membership that, that suited him to allow him to kind of escape from any trouble he might get into. So I, I think that a thorough investigation needs to be done this time about, and, it, and it needs to start with who knew what and when, right? Because the culture isn't going to change until those kinds of things are figured out. Who who knew uh, about Vince's misdeeds and and these allegations against him, uh, and and who helped permit this culture to to kind of take root? And I think it's important to note too that the main reason that this lawsuit from Janelle Grant came out was that the they deemed her and her legal counsel deemed that the NDA that she signed wasn't enforceable for a variety of reasons one of which was that she was not going to be able to tell anybody that she worked at WWE which would actually prevent her from being able to get work later on but the other piece of it was that Vince McMahon and uh Janelle Grant through their legal counsel had agreed for a three million dollar payment of which he only paid $1 million. And people might wonder, well, why couldn't he pay her? And now he either stopped paying her. I mean, there's also a possibility that the, and it was even referred to in the lawsuit that the board of directors were starting to breathe down his neck a little bit. That was actually in the suit itself. So I wonder, since some of this was related to his marriage to Linda McMahon, and some of this was related, like he had family members on the board of directors, did he have bank accounts that were not tied to family members who he might leave a paper trail for if he was paying someone an NDA for this? So I, that's kind of what made me think, uh, okay, well, because the main question that came out of that was, why can't he pay $2 million? He's Vince McMahon. And but there might be other things in play there because the, one of the things that he got nailed on in the past was that he was paying for these things with company funds. So I think that's a piece to to think about. Um, it's notable in this case that he, unless he comes out of retirement, will not be represented by his longtime counsel Jerry McDevitt, who uh, retired last year. This is what I think about with the culture of this, though. The culture in WWE is always kind of like protect yourself, look the other way, and unless it directly affects you, stay away, stay away from it. And the culture in pro wrestling is always just kind of grown-up kids on the road doing stuff. So, like, I think that both cultures are wrong because, you know, in the WWE case, you're trying not to be seen by Vince McMahon in any negative light at all. So... You might see him walking around. Oh, he's got a new girlfriend. I don't know what the heck that means, but I want to stay away from it and I don't want to think about it. So to the to Nick's point, it's who actually knew the depth of what was happening. Some of the board members may have because they were given a heads up on this case when it was previously, uh, you know, when it started. It's the other thing I'll say about Vince before I hand it over to Vaughn for some thoughts on this is just Vince McMahon has lived in this pro wrestling bubble since about 1957 when he met his father for the first time when he was 12. And when this all started for him in the business, he was a man overseeing a regional product with other, you know, regional friends of his dad's, which is a whole lot different than someone overseeing a global business and especially one with the potential of a five billion dollar rights deal with someone and the biggest movie star in the world joining his publicly traded board of directors. So, Vaughn, I give you a lot to jump <laughs> off of there. Jump off of it however you'd like. Yeah, I mean, you bring up a good point in that Vince, in a lot of ways, has been in the pro wrestling bubble, whether you call it pro wrestling or sports entertainment, whatever. He's been in that bubble for, like you said, since the fifties. And he's got a lot of ways in him that's still like a very old school promoter, like and old school wrestling promoter, like which is very cutthroat and, and unscrupulous in a lot of ways. And that doesn't jive with corporate America. Now, it has he's sort of gotten away with it for 20 plus years since the company's gone public. But now there are other players involved. It's, they're not an independent entity anymore. They're, they're 
in a merger with another major corporation that's owned by another major corporation. So, uh, yeah, clearly, if you know, according to the lawsuit, hasn't necessarily adapted to that atmosphere. But WWE, despite its success, has long been, you know, especially before they went public, was pretty much a mom and pop. It was Vince and his homies running the show and his kids running that company uh, before the before they went public. So, yeah, you, you got a lot. That, you got a point there when it comes to uh, Vince and maybe not necessarily adapting to the environment that he created uh, with his success with WWE. And as far as the culture in WWE, it starts with Vince McMahon in a lot of ways. I mean, in all ways. I mean, he kind of creates that culture. He sets that precedent and he allows that to fester throughout the organization. And it's, a, it's based on a lot of the times, it seems like at least, it feels like it's based on the fear. And you hear this from a lot of people who have worked for WWE for many, many years or in other cases, brief periods of time. And they all have that, oh, it's, you know, that fear of Vince McMahon is intimidating as his intimidating presence. And you don't want to run afoul of the boss. You don't cross the boss. That wasn't just a catchy saying on TV. That was real life. So when you have that fear inherently built into the company, these things, it allows these allegations to arise where people don't want to say anything. People don't want to confront these very, you know, sensitive situations because of fear of, like you said, retribution and, and the loss of income, potentially loss of your livelihood. Uh, it, like I said, it's a culture that will have to change in this new era. And there are a lot of people who aren't used to, you know, that type of influence coming into the company. Now they might have to, they might have to adapt because there are, again, other players involved in WWE now that weren't there even two years ago. Yeah. And I think the most important part of this too is uh, you know, Vince McMahon is not the big boss anymore. Ari Emanuel is. Vince McMahon owns 11% of TKO now, which is not enough for the voting power that he had that was able to have him replacing members of the board of directors. Nick, when somebody, somebody asked me what I thought was going to happen after Thursday happened, and I said, I think he's going to be gone by the end of Friday. And I didn't even fully believe myself when I said that. But it ended up happening that way. The reason I wasn't totally sure was because UFC, under the management of Endeavor, now TKO, but it was Endeavor at the time that this happened, had a situation late last year where Dana White was seen slapping his wife on camera in the middle of uh, they were in the middle of doing the publicity for Dana White's power slap at the time. And then that, then that happened. Absolutely nothing happened to Dana White, to my knowledge, other than, as he said, the court of public opinion dragged him. And that was what he thought was his punishment for that. Is this a wake up call for TKO that they need to not only clean house of whomever was aware of any of the misdeeds of Vince McMahon here, but that they need to take this, you know, this culture of not taking care of victims and, and and hiding things that they, this is going to hurt you as a company if you keep doing this. Right. Yeah. I, I think, I think there are a lot of eyes on Ari Emanuel right now, uh, simply because he so publicly kind of sided with Vince when the merger was going through, right. He's he, uh, th uh, there are a lot of reports that said that Vince was willing to kind of uh, you know, and, and I don't know how much we all believe them, because Vince is Vince, but there were reports anyway that Vince was willing to kind of ride off into the sunset once the merger went through. And Ari Emanuel very publicly went forward and said, no, you know, I'm kind of insisting that Vince is still part of this team. Well, now that's already come back to bite him. So I think there are definitely, you know, everybody is watching now to see, uh, can you be the person that, that changes things? And, um, you know, I, I, it has to come from there, right? Because, because like we're we're talking about the culture is so deep rooted within WWE. What's going to change it? Well, the power the power that's now above WWE, and that is TKO. That's the board. That's the executives, and the, and that starts with Ari Emanuel. Yeah, and I, I just uh, it it doesn't seem you know the, the other thing the other reason I thought that there was a chance that we might be having Vince stick around longer is that it was always reported that he thought that him stepping down. Uh, in was that 2022 in the summer that that was a mistake 
and that he should have stayed on and fought the charges so that he didn't have to fight to get back in again. But the other thing was like whether or not, you know, TKO could actually even legally remove him from the position, which is just preposterous to me that you wouldn't be able to remove somebody based on allegations of sex trafficking and rape. But it's just I I can't uh, I, I just can't fathom that this this you don't want <laughs> think of all the deals that they're in the middle of. Just take the person stuff totally out of it. Financially, this will cripple your company if you continue to <laughs> engage in a culture like that. Um, let's move on to uh, so the Royal Rumble goes on as planned. Uh, Vince leaves essentially, I think, right in the middle of SmackDown, I think, was when the news started uh, circulating that he was gone. Uh, the Royal Rumble goes down, card occurs, Paul Levesque gets ready to do a press conference uh, sponsored by, I think, C4 Energy, if I remember. And he gets a series of questions about, you know, pretty much everything we're talking about here, of when he knew about the allegations, his reaction to them, what the culture can be, how they need to change the culture. And Vaughn, he handled that press conference just about as poorly as a high-ranking official and a member of the board of directors probably could have. I was shocked at how ill-prepared he was for the questions that he got. What was? What did you think? Yeah, I agree. As far as uh, the only thing was missing, they didn't put on like, a pair of sunglasses and a furry hat. You know, his answer wasn't like the worst, but it was just the lack of preparedness that kind of surprised me because it surprised me with AEW. You know, there are both companies have PR professionals that work for them. And you would think that they would at least have a statement ready to go as soon as the presser starts. Even if he doesn't answer questions after that, you have a statement that points to something as far as an answer. And they that didn't happen on either side from Tony Khan's side or Triple H's side. It's just, I don't understand that. I don't know why. If it's like an obvious, uh, you know, s- solution to your issue here, if you don't have an answer, you can have one ready. This, you don't have to spitball this. This could, be, this could be written down and prepared throughout the day during the show. So it's ready to go and covers all the bases. Even if it's a non-answer, it covers all the bases and you can move on from there. But just, just the fact that there's nothing ready and it, it seemingly catches them flat-footed, I don't understand that. You open yourself up to these press conferences you let real media in. You treat this like it's regular sports. If this was, you know, if, if you're Tony Khan, if this is Doug Peterson and something happened to one of the players, Doug Peterson's going to get asked about it. And same side, same goes for Triple H. They got to think of it like they're like an NFL head coach or a GM. When something happens with a player or an athlete on a team, people get asked about it. You got to be ready for that. And I don't understand why neither side were ready. One thing I'll say, just so we don't get a false equivalency going here, is that what AEW was facing at the World's End press conference was allegations that came up on social media and have never actually been any charges or in a lawsuit or anything to that extent. That's fair. Um, uh, You know, what we saw here against WWE and TKO and Vince McMahon and John Laurinaitis was you know a 60 67 page suit i'm not sure officially if it has actually been served to the people who it was for yet but um and i still feel as though is even if it's just a rumor on the internet you're going to get asked sure you got to know what's coming like and then that that takes social listening. You got to listen to what's happening out there and know that it's going to come. Even if there's not an official, like I said, in, in WWE's case, it's very official. So you, you definitely want to get yeah. asked. And but, AEW's was not, but you still got to know what's coming. But I'll say too, the TKO actually did put out a statement and that would have been something that Paul that could have used yeah. in that moment. They came out with that statement on Friday night when he got let go about what the investigation was. And even if you're not going to talk, Right. or you can't, or you don't legally think you should, like your parent company actually did make a statement. So at least yeah. point to like that. Nick, you were going to jump in there. Sorry. Well, I mean, I, I have a, a couple of years in PR uh, in my background. And one of the things that we always did for our clients was crisis comms, right? And there couldn't be a bigger crisis in my mind for WWE than 
hey, Vince McMahon, the person that brought this company to prominence, has been hit with the most disturbing allegations, you know, so far. Uh, so, so this is a crisis comm situation. And as Vaughn said, not only could they have done a prepared statement, but what also that we used to do for clients is, hey, these are the kinds of questions you are likely to face from reporters. And it doesn't take that much, you know, it doesn't take, it's not rocket science. It doesn't take that much time to go through and say, hey, you're going to have media in front of you. These are the kinds of questions you are likely to face. Here are the things that you should say. Here are the, here are the ways that you can, you can come across and say, hey, we don't condone the kinds of things that are in these allegations. We're taking this as seriously as possible. It's under investigation. And, and, and that's it. Uh, it doesn't take that long to prepare executives for that. And it was super surprising, not just as Vaughn said, not to have a prepared statement of some sort for him to point to, but just that he didn't seem ready for the kinds of questions that he got. And I'll give some credit to a couple of friends of this show, John Alba and Cameron Hawkins were the first two. Uh, Cameron followed up on John's and then Brandon Thurston, who I've actually joined on, on his show before, actually was the one who followed up on Cam's. Uh, in addition, Nick Hausman asked a question to Cody Rhodes, which I found kind of unique. Cody didn't do a terrible job of answering it, but you know, the, the fact remains, he's a talent right now. And I think, I think he was actually an executive with AEW when all the, for the timeline of when this would have happened anyway. So he's really just speaking to it as a, as a person who works for WWE reacting to it. So uh, that was a little, uh, that was a little strange too. And I, I get it too. Like your children's grandfather is accused of sex trafficking and rape. It sucks, but you're the front facing executive representing the company and you're also a member of the board of directors you have some sort of responsibility to represent you know the truth and also the other thing that i think really annoyed people too vaughn was that he not only said that he didn't read the lawsuit but he framed the week as a whole as a great week for wwe which i think really rankled a lot of people and look, I can understand. Look, he's a busy guy, and it took me a while to get through that. And I, like you said, he his his children's grandfather is accused of some heinous things in his lawsuit. So I could imagine if he didn't necessarily want to sit down and read through it all the way through before the rumble. Um, but it's again, you still got to be prepared in that moment uh, to have have an answer. Also, like you said, a, a great week for WWE. Yeah. I guess on one end, it started out that way, but clearly it is not. That week is that great week is over uh, when when these allegations drop. Uh, it is now a terrible week, honestly. It, it, it kind of over. It definitely puts a dark cloud over all the success that WWE lauded themselves for earlier in the week with the Netflix deal. Of course, you get the Royal Rumble, so there's a lot of press around that, and a lot of uh, announcements and and good, uh, you know, supposedly good attention around that, but. This you know lawsuit marred the whole week, so you can't say that. that. That's these are the things I'm talking about when it comes to prepping the executives, how they should approach these press conferences, and how you don't say you don't go out there and say this is a great week. You say this is a good show, not a great week because the week was also in included this lawsuit. Yeah. So there's certain there's just certain things you that, that has to go into being prepared for these situations that just seems like it's lacking right now. And it's also to me just a callous disregard for the victim here yeah um regardless of you know if 10 percent of what is alleged in that suit including the text messages that were screenshotted from vince mcmahon are accurate i mean it's as bad as you can possibly get we need to know who knew what when nick what happens if Vince McMahon, and it's probably going to happen, what happens if Vince McMahon's phone gets subpoenaed? Holy cow, what are we going to find in there? Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think it's important to remember that this is only the latest and worst of a series of allegations. Yep. Probably one of only a number of, uh, you know, alleged victims. So I, I think you're absolutely right. I, I as horrible and, and as kind of, you know, unthinkable as some of these allegations in this lawsuit are, there is still uh, kind of incredibly very much a chance that even more is going to come out. And, um, I, you know, I, I can't even imagine what, what that could be. And, you know, you, you want to know, and I noted some of these down, so if I'm reading them, I'm just reading, but um, who was in any position to stop it? 
without a fear of retribution? Who actively went along with it? Who looked at it, like I said before, oh, Vince has a girlfriend and, and didn't say anything about it, didn't know the rest. You know, you can claim ignorance on that, but it's also bad to think that, like, so somebody wouldn't think twice that he's walking around with a, an employee as a girlfriend while he's married? So, I mean, that that's another one. Um, to me, Vaughn, like, if nothing else out of this, if nothing criminal ends up coming of this, anything, TKO seriously needs some conduct clauses with its employees, don't they? Yes, it's, it's got to be some type of major change coming out of this. This is as, as embarrassing of a look for TKO they could have at the moment right now. It's, it's that bad. And so, yeah, th there has to be, you can't just go on status quo business as usual after this. You, there has to be some type of, and I'm not going to, I'm usually not fond of advocating for people losing their jobs, but that might have to be on the table uh, along with just a complete culture change. Cause again, it's a bad look for the whole company. It's a bad look for the whole industry of wrestling too, by the way, I don't think it's just bad for the T for TKO. Uh, I think it's a bad look for the whole industry, which has also been under fire for, you know, sexual deviance allegations in the past, the industry. So, but I, I to limit it back to TKO. I think there has to be some type of significant change within the company moving forward, whether that's uh, clauses and contracts or change in personnel. There has to be sweeping changes. Yeah, I agree. And then Nick, you were kind of, you kind of mentioned it before, but uh you know, just to recap all of the different things that Vince McMahon, you know, is is facing right now. In addition to this suit that came out on Thursday or Tuesday, Tuesday, I think, or maybe it was Thursday. I don't it remember. It was Thursday, I believe. Yeah, yeah. it seems yeah. time last has week, flown by since last then. week is ridiculous in my mind right now. I don't even remember <laughs> which day any of this happened on. But yeah, it was Thursday. You're right. But, uh, you know, there's also the specter of a federal investigation into him going on, too, that has come up more than once in both TKO filings and I think was also referenced in the Wall Street Journal report also supposedly TKO is doing an internal investigation into this. They need to, if they're going to weed out anybody, you know, if they are some of the reports on Friday that came out basically said that they were going to basically try to get anybody out who was like a Vince loyalist, essentially, which could be all sorts of different people uh, in all sorts of different roles, including the two members of the board of directors that he put back on who were, had left. Um, He's also had a number of other NDAs with other, in other cases, the Reader Chatterton case that came back up because of the Adult Victims Act in New York State, that then there was a payment made for that, and then that went away. The one at the, I believe it was a tanning salon in Florida that happened, that that went away. So it's like the culture overall ends up being that like this guy, you know, if, if you follow the charges and you follow the uh allegations and then whatever the agreements are and then this case too you've got a person at the top of this company who can do what he wants without any check on him at all so um i guess i'm just throwing this to you nick for you know how does that happen in 2024 well, I, I think I think Vaughn might have touched on this earlier, right? And that is the fact that WWE has transformed over the years from basically a family-run business to a major corporation, right? And some things that people can get away with when the company is in one form, uh, you know, simply can't can't happen when when there's more oversight. So, um, you know, and you spoke to it too. What's kind of crazy to think about is that the position that Vince McMahon was in, even after the TKO merger, made him sort of difficult to get rid of. And I, and I don't know all the particulars. I'm certainly not uh, like a corporate lawyer or an expert in that field. But I will say that everybody else that works for WWE doesn't have those same kind of protections. They're not the executive chairman. They're not, except for Triple H and a couple other people, members of the board. So when this investigation goes through and and you know the hope of everybody is that it is extremely thorough but if people have to lose their jobs as Vaughn said I don't advocate for people losing their jobs either but if that's what has to happen in in this uh 
there aren't the same kind of, uh, you know, barriers up to get rid of other people who might have enabled this or helped Vince get away with it. Uh, if, if these allegations are true. So, um, you know, if they have to do a house cleaning, then they have to do a house cleaning. And, and that's what has to happen. All right. To wrap up, Vaughn, what do you think the most important thing that we learned out of all of this happening over the last week was? Man, uh, I think that I think it's twofold. I think is, you know, how many victims, potential victims are there? And just, man, what did they go through and how unfortunate it was? And also really just WWE's culture and how it enabled Vince McMahon to potentially, allegedly, you know, commit all of these acts. Uh, so I think those are the two things, victims and WWE's culture. And, and even if, like you said, a percentage, a portion of this uh, lawsuit and these allegations are true, it still points to a unsafe work environment within WWE. Yeah, it, it's that's the thing for me too. It's like you know, it's it's you know, these charges might turn into you know criminal charges that he's got to defend himself against, and I'm sure a lot of people, especially the people who work in WWE, are thinking about well, what is the future of WWE? I personally like whether Vince McMahon is gone or the top fifteen people in that company are gone there's probably going to be a WWE. It's a f too valuable of a brand, even outside of those human beings that exists and continues to be profitable in spite of a lot of different controversy going on. So I don't think that's, I, I think the key here is the victims, like you said, if there are any others and just, you know, how deep does this go? Like if, if, you know, yes, you want to, uh, you know, take the, the suit seriously, but, um, you, you know, you're talking about a guy who worked for the company since 1969 in its previous iteration and bought it in 1982, if I got my timeline correct. So, I mean, you're talking about a culture in some form or another that existed, however it was for maybe 42 years, if not longer, you know, and, and it's just, Nick, what do you, what, what, what should we take away from this? Like what, where, where's your mind going with this? I, I think the most important thing that, that arose for this week is for TKO to realize that if they thought that they had kind of ridden out the worst of things with Vince McMahon and with the way things used to be in WWE, that, that certainly this is the most obvious in your face way to prove that is not true that that it, they they haven't just put the past behind them and that there are, are still repercussions that are going to be ongoing for a long time and so they're going to have to face up to that fact and now the eyes of of not just this industry but really the world are on them to see um, what what they do next all right uh serious topics today but we got to cover them because you know if you if you cover the positive you got to cover everything uh you know there's lots of different things and ways to take wrestling in its business and it's as its entertainment form and it's important to in a multi-billion dollar industry to hold the industry and its leader and its members accountable for how they treat people and for how they do their business. So um, really important stuff I think we did today. I want to thank Nick Tilwalk, Wrestling Junkie Managing Editor, Vaughn Johnson, Wrestling Junkie Columnist. You can catch her stuff on that site through the uh, USA Today Sports Media Group. Uh, I'm Phil Strum, and we'll see you again for Under the Ring Pro Wrestling Conversations. Thank you very much.